Hey, mental workers, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are talking about feedback. And this episode was prompted by one of our listeners who sent me an email and said, hey, could you do an episode on how we can cope with the confusing, ambiguous, and sometimes mean feedback we get from supervisors? I've got friend of the podcast because she's appeared before, so now she's a friend. I didn't talk about this with you beforehand, Betty, but you're a friend. Um, I like that. (laughs) So friend of the podcast has returned to us. Her name is Betty Farrell, and she is a provisional psychologist who works in corrections. Hi, Betty. Hi, Bron. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you going? Good. I, look, I think this is a great topic for today. I, I think this is something that we all struggle with. I think this is going to be fabulous. Me too. Yes, I do agree that I think it's something we all struggle with. So let me just define feedback. And just to give you an overview of this episode, listeners, we're going to talk about what feedback is. We're going to just unpack a bit fear of failure and really sensitivity to feedback experiences in your internship or your registrar programs. And then Betty and I are going to go through a bunch of experiences that we've had with feedback and unpack some lessons in how we've coped with it. Sound good, Betty? Sounds good to me. Great. Let me just get a really brief definition of feedback. And I just wanted to make it really simple. Guys, feedback is any sort of verbal, written, maybe even body language feedback that you get from supervisors, colleagues, peers about your performance, how you're doing in the workplace or how you are doing in the therapy context. Does that sound about right to you, Betty? That sounds perfect to me. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So the first thing I wanted to unpack with you, Betty, was how do you feel about feedback in general? Like when I say to you, Betty, I'm going to give you some feedback about your work performance. What's your immediate reaction? Oh, don't we turn a bit cold inside? Aren't we always worried about... And and the thing, the surprising thing is, I think, is that we expect the feedback to be negative. That's true. We don't feel that anyone's going to speak to me and tell me, hey, you're doing a fabulous job and I love what you're doing out there daily. (laughs) We immediately go to that negative issue. And I think it's also really important how feedback is set up in terms of how we can receive it. If I am going into a room with someone who's um, a senior in the in the department where I work and they're sitting at the back of a big broad desk, that's probably a little bit more intimidating than having a quiet catch up in the kitchen over a cup of tea, isn't it? That's so true. And it's it's interesting what you're saying there. It's like our body is priming itself to receive this negative feedback. So it might already be scared, feeling defensive even. Yeah, it almost triggers that fight or flight response, it does. doesn't it? Yeah. And so you're absolutely right. Nobody, if somebody said to me, Bron, I'm going to give you some feedback on your how you're working, I wouldn't actually expect that to be positive. I would prime myself for the fight or flight. And you know, I think the thing that we do sometimes is we are, are so triggered by the idea of receiving feedback that sometimes we compensate immediately by saying, oh, yes, I know I'm doing a terrible job and I'm so sorry and, you know, and I didn't mean to mess something up. You know, we almost jump in and start hanging ourselves before we've even heard what the feedback is about. Oh, we do too. And I'm guilty of that. I would just, I'll just start apologizing. So I'll tell the listeners my immediate reactions to feedback. One, I avoid it. Two, I apologize. I did that today. I started off with a, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, put the handcuffs on me. I'm in trouble. Forgive me. I'm a human being. I'm yeah. still learning. I'm not completely perfect, nor ever will be. Let me start to apologize as if it's a big inconvenience instead of recognizing it as this is a learning moment. Yeah. I think another component of this, when I think about feedback, it's who you're receiving it from. You mentioned before, Betty, that if somebody's on the other side of a big desk, let's say it's the CEO or a supervisor who you really respect. I think if I get sued, feedback from somebody who I don't want to let down and who I want to make proud, I get this immediate like cringe inside. I'm like, oh no, what about you? I know. I I always feel like it, it's a bit like entering the principal's office. Yes. Though I was never a naughty child at school, so I don't know what that's like. <laughs> or I always feel like I'm about to hear from my mother's voice where I've done something wrong. And, you know, it, it just amplifies those feelings and that reaction instead of being able to keep calm and hear what's being said. It's tricky. Yeah. And I mean, when you talk about hearing your mum's voice, it's I think this speaks to how common yours and I's reaction to feedback is. I imagine that everyone else, you know, I'd wager it, maybe just about everybody else who's listening to this podcast would also have that fight flight reaction to feedback. 
Oh, definitely, definitely. I think I think the relationship you have with the person providing the feedback is really important as to how relaxed or open you are to having that feedback. Um, you know, but also on the other side is if you're, like you said, really concerned about damaging that relationship, or oh, this is the CEO of the company and I've let them down, then that can be really impede the opportunity to hear what we've done and to be able to build on that skill. Mm, so I guess we're already identifying that the uh, mindset that we bring to receiving the feedback can make it more difficult to cope with that feedback? I, I, I think so, 100%. I think, I think because I think really it's our self-image has been challenged. Yeah. Our role, our core business is working with others to develop some skills to improve the best outcome for their life. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what our daily business is. You know, we, we're here to help. You know, we realise that no one's perfect, but nobody actually wants to hear that you're not perfect. No. But our self-image of I'm doing my very best, I'm working in a really complex environment, you know, we are not, we're not in a mechanical job, we're actually in a compassionate job. There's a cost for us every day with the people that we work with. So when we're told what you're bringing isn't the best or isn't enough or isn't perfect, that really hurts the way we view ourselves. Oh, it totally does. Even as you're speaking, I'm like feeling some of those emotions myself and I'm like, oh, it does hurt. It does hurt my self-image. It does because we shut down because we think, oh, no, honestly, I'm, I'm here to do the very best and get the best outcome for my client because I care about the human race. Yeah. So to be told you're not doing enough or you're not doing good enough or you're not doing the best, it's really challenging. Yeah, I often think no one goes into work in our roles to go do a terrible job. We all want to do the best. So as you say, Betty, when we get that feedback, it can be really challenging for us. But my question is, is that what our, is that what our feedback is about? Sometimes it's not mm. about ourselves or not doing things well enough or not giving enough or not being good enough. Sometimes it simply is about um, processes and policies and procedures. Yeah, It's not actually personalised feedback. It's not you as a person are not doing a great enough job. Sometimes it's you haven't got this skill set yet and our role is to actually help you achieve that. Yes, and I think this is one of the key things that we will extract. So, listener, a key aim of this episode is to help you cope better with this confusing, sometimes mean, sometimes confusing feedback. And I think one of the things that we'll extract that Betty and I want to get across is that we need to contextualise the feedback, that sometimes it is just simply about a process not being followed and it's not about you as a person who is bad or failing or deficient in some way. Definitely. Yeah. So, let's go through a few... I don't want to say dilemmas, I guess experiences that that we've both experienced. And I wanted to start off with this, I've written it down here as prisoner book story. We talked about this <laughs> off air <laughs> and Betty has kindly gone through the troves of her memory and picked this one out as an exemplar to discuss and unpack. So Betty, I'll hand it over to you. What's prisoner book story about? What happened? This happened to me almost a year ago, and it's I can still feel the sting of that reprimand, feedback, conversation, redirection, whatever you want to call it, I still feel it. So I work in a custodial setting. I work with high-risk men. I was working with a prisoner who was a, um, a prescribed prisoner, so he wasn't to be released at the end of his sentence, and he was a prolific self-harmer. Um, some of the things that he used to manage that emotional dysregulation was to keep his mind busy. So he used to read a lot and he was quite an intelligent, capable man. And like most intelligent, capable people, they have a preference about what kind of material they want to read. I was unable to get a book for him on the weekend. Weekends were terrible um, crisis points for him because there's less activity, less movement, less distraction in a, in a custodial setting on the weekend. So it's a high risk period for him. I couldn't get him a book. So I actually had on my desk a secondhand copy of Lincoln Hall's autobiography. And I thought, great, I'm going to take that down. The problem is this man is at risk of harming himself. I'm resolving that issue for him by providing him something that's local, Australian, interesting, challenging, inspiring. Ta-da, I've done my job. Well, when I came back into work a couple of days later, people had found out that I'd provided him with the book and so I was reprimanded 
checked, provided feedback about crossing a boundary and actually behaving in an inappropriate manner with a vulnerable client. How did you feel in that moment receiving that feedback? Oh, honestly, I did not take a breath. I did not talk to my brain about not reacting. My hackles went up. And I did go into a boardroom with a big broad table and people were sat against the window on the other side. And I was sat facing these people and I was um, told about taking advantage of a vulnerable person, of crossing boundaries, of inappropriate care, all of those things that go against my self-image and what my core values are. I was sitting facing into the light and I was like, this is purposefully planned to intimidate. Um, It wasn't my finest hour, but I was really caught up in the emotion of it, being told that I'd done the wrong thing. I didn't feel like I was heard. I really struggled to explain myself. I'd only been in the role for a couple of months, so it was really quite challenging establishing my identity in that moment as well. There was no support person for me either. So I just felt really overwhelmed. And when I left the room, I didn't handle it very well. I was really overwhelmed. So what do we do with overwhelmed emotions? Well, we either keep them down or we spill them out. So I spilled it out ungracefully and spoke to some of my colleagues about what had just happened. It did not bode well for me, but it was a great lesson to learn from. Uh, My heart goes out to you because what I'm hearing is with giving the prisoner the book, I'm hearing your compassionate side come out. It's like we go into work wanting to do a good job for the vulnerable populations we work with. And then your workplace is directly telling you, you've taken advantage of a vulnerable person. And I can see how that would get just that fight mode up. Uh, With distance, I can hear what they were saying about compromising those boundaries and perhaps introducing a confusing element of a working relationship with um, a vulnerable client. Um, There was questions about keeping the book, getting the book back. I said, look, the book was like $8 from a secondhand store. I don't care if he keeps it. Um, that can be perceived as a gift. You're giving a gift to this one. Are you going to give a gift to everyone else? So even though it was framed within policies and procedures to keep the client in a respectful position, that was not the way I heard it. So I can see that reflect on that now, but at that time I couldn't. I just want to talk really briefly about um, managing that emotion. I I think if I'd been able to manage that emotion to start with, perhaps I would have heard the feedback better. I think when we hear feedback, the first thing we need to do is stop take a breath and don't react. We really need to settle ourselves so that we can hear what's being said. And we did talk about the nature of the relationship, the nature of the context that the feedback is provided in. Some of those things we have no control over. The only thing we do have control over is ourselves. So if we can just take a moment, take a breath, and then hear what's being said, you do need to acknowledge what you're feeling and we would call that affect labeling. It's not about thinking, overthinking about it. It's not thinking really deep about it, but it's just about describing what you're feeling. I'm surprised. I'm embarrassed. I'm scared that my job might be in jeopardy. I'm confused about what's happening. I'm feeling overwhelmed by this. When we acknowledge the way that we're feeling by using those words, it, you could kind of feel that that decrease in anxiety, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be embarrassed. It's okay to be surprised. I'm not blaming or attributing this to anybody else. It's just how I'm feeling it. And when we can say how we're feeling, then we can. it goes a long way to self-regulating what's happening for us in that moment, which puts us in a better mindset to actually hear what's being said to us. I love that. And it was something that I was going to say because it does sound like when you first received that feedback, it was unexpected. It was surprising. You did feel confused. You did feel overwhelmed. Is that right? Oh, I felt intimidated. I was embarrassed. It sat really uncomfortable with me, the insinuation that I had taken advantage of my position of having access with this um, prescribed prisoner. And, and was gifting him things, which was not my intention at all. 
my intention was to um, be compassionate, provide support, reduce risk, um, keep him safe. But um, the, the perception that it was something different was oh, I was ashamed. And shame is one of the worst emotions we can feel, yeah. especially in a workplace where you're really vulnerable. Absolutely. And so I love what you said before then as well, that in that moment, what we can do for ourselves is we can stop, take a moment to breathe and then label what we're experiencing and say that out loud. So we could say something like, let me just take a moment here. I'm feeling really overwhelmed or I'm feeling surprised. Is that what you would recommend? Definitely. Mm. Definitely. The same as you said before, Bron, about how we feel put on the spot and that fight flight response kicks in and our first thing is to apologize and make it better for the other person no no in this moment i am receiving the feedback in this moment i'm going to take care of myself i'm going to stop checking with how i'm feeling and i'm going to label how i'm feeling oh, i'm very surprised by this or i'm uncomfortable and i need some support can i get someone from the office to come in with you you know our, our, in the moment where we are receiving the feedback, it is not our responsibility to alleviate the stress or the pressure of the person who's providing the feedback. We can recognize that sometimes it's hard to tell people they're not doing a great job. That's not an easy position. But when it's sprung on us or we don't know it's coming, our job is to take care of ourselves first. That is so true because what I was hearing with that situation, you mentioned that you did not feel heard in receiving the feedback. And so I'm thinking, let's say we stop, pause, describe our feelings to the other person. That could actually help give us the space we need, but also help to get our needs met more so that we can be heard. I think um, I was so overwhelmed and so embarrassed and that immediate, sorry, sorry, how can I fix this, that I didn't feel heard. Yeah. And it really did challenge my self-identity of not this compassionate, thoughtful woman, but this advantage-seeking, um, disrespectful person that I did feel overwhelmed. So I couldn't even make proper sentences to explain what I had done or why I had done it, but also it was a very emotional moment. It, w it felt like it went on for an hour and it was probably no more than 10 minutes, but it was an emotional moment where I feel the more I spoke in that panic, um, the more I upset the person providing me the feedback. And she was then struggling to manage her own emotional response because I think she just wanted to be really clear cut. Look. You've breached a policy, you've, you've broken a procedure, and this is the way we do things, and this is why we do things. But I think this stuff goes to that, that core business of who we are. My workplace saw me as breaching a boundary. I can see that now with space, but I saw it as being compassionate. And in that moment, I needed a little bit of self-affirmation that, yeah, I am a good person. In this context, this this. This action doesn't fit in this context. I can acknowledge that. But in the community, in my family, in my home, in your church, those kind of actions are what we really want from people. So it's kind of like balancing up the context and what is the feedback actually about? Are you talking about me as a person? Are you talking about a skill set I haven't developed yet? and will need some support because none of us come fully formed or are you talking about a policy and procedure that I'm just not aware of? So one thing that can really help with receiving feedback, I know listeners might not be giving feedback, but I'll just share one of my favorite lines that I actually do with clients when I give them feedback. And I, this is that I give them the benefit of the doubt. So I usually say something like, you probably don't even realize, or I know this wasn't your intention. And that is trying me trying to affirm them that I don't think they're a bad person. They just might not even realize, but this is what's happened. Do you think if somebody had said that to you or some other sort of validating statement, I guess about your humanity, your compassion, that could have helped you? I think it's a really gentle way to open up that conversation. I think it's a really validating way of saying, you know, you are valued here. We don't see you as a, as a troublemaker or someone who can't yeah. follow the rules. 
but what we need to talk about this issue here as opposed to you as a person. I think that would have been really helpful in that moment, but I did. I felt blindsided, felt overwhelmed. I felt immediately on the defence and um, it, it was the real language of taking advantage of someone else that really didn't sit well with me. It really sounds like it. Yeah, I, I think if I was in the same position, I would feel similarly sh- shaken. So maybe something that I want to extract from this is that, listeners, it's okay if you're not your finest self when you're receiving feedback because it is it can be overwhelming. It can be very challenging. And any way that you respond is the best that you can do in that situation. Oh, A hundred percent. And, you know, I say, take a breath, (laughs) close your mouth for a minute. (laughs) I don't know about, I don't know about other people, but my mouth's got me more trouble than it has out of. (laughs) But you take a breath, take care of yourself. And I know that's really easy to say, but when we're in a heightened situation and our amygdala is going off and we're having that fight flight response, I just think it's a really hard thing to do. And unfortunately, we only develop these skills when we practice them over and over, but nobody wants to receive loads and loads of bad feedback to get better no. at responding. <laughs> yeah, That's like if difficulty. I make exposure group for feedback, I can't imagine that many people would sign up. Really? But I think that it, we need to take time and we need to take a moment and we need to take care of ourselves first. That's fantastic for in that moment. You then said that you went out and talked to your peers and which you said again wasn't your finest hour. But I'm wondering about the aftermath because when you speak about it now, it sounds like you've got it very clear in your mind that, okay, this was a policy issue. Um, It's not a me issue. I was still being nice and compassionate. Can you walk us through how you came to that? I know that's a difficult question, but how did you come to that, I guess, quite healthy perspective on this situation? I think, I think we've got to accept that, they, that our, my supervisor will always see it one way and I will always see it a different way. Did I breach a boundary that, that's a, a particular written policy? Yes, I did. Was it perhaps the most compassionate thing to do? I don't know, but at the time that I did it, now I can see, well, this is who I am. Would I make that mistake again? No, I wouldn't. But it really took me a long time to figure out what that feedback was about. What was I actually hearing? Do others see me that way? I think the biggest regret out of how I handled that was the panic that I felt in the room and then leaving the room and having a big emotional vomit on the people I worked with. The, the danger in that really is is damaging relationships. You, know, you don't see it as an opportunity. This is a chance for me to stop and reflect and see what am I doing well, what am I doing bad. See, and unfortunately, that's the thing about feedback is um, people don't sandwich it with, you're doing a great job no, and we're don't. really pleased with this, but we've noticed this has crept up in your work or I don't know that you're aware of this, but this is the way we do things here. But we're really grateful you're part of the team. People don't sandwich feedback like that. They go straight into the guts and say, look, we're really time poor. You're doing a crap job. Yeah, they Pack do. it in. You know, straight into that fight or flight response. And so with, okay, spilling your guts to your colleagues and the consequences of that and damaging, potentially damaging the relationships, how did you come to see that maybe it wasn't what you had first thought the feedback was about? I think the only thing that makes um, feedback better is time. Mm. I think time, you know, is a, is a great thing. Time in the role, time to look at other relationships, time to really understand what my role in in the workplace or working with any vulnerable client is. Uh, when I first started, I was very idealistic and thought we've just got to love people hard enough and we can save everyone. But the reality is that's not what our work is and it's not our job to save anyone. Our job is to upskill people and help them make better choices in their own life and support them in that change process, which is difficult. Our job is not to save anyone. But um, that took a lot of time so I can see it now and I can reflect on it. But it probably took me a good couple of months to get over it. And I don't know, and I, being really honest, I don't know my relationship with the person who provided that feedback is is um has improved to the point where I'm more open to receiving feedback from them. I don't know providing feedback is her best attribute, you know, but um I find that whenever that um 
supervisor provides me feedback, I'm always a little resistant to it. And I think maybe we've just got a mismatch. Maybe she's a better company man than I am and 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 we've got to be okay with that. Yeah, I think by the nature of our roles as well, there is there is this ambiguity inherent in it because we go in to be compassionate. And I think this is what you're speaking to when you're trying to define your role. It's like, what is my role? It's not necessarily to save everyone, but to provide them with the skills that they can then make good choices in their lives. And it sounds like that helped to reframe what it is that you do in your day-to-day work. Yeah, it is. And I think that um, if you can, if you're incredibly skilled and able to manage yourself, when you're receiving feedback, I think the best thing is to focus on this is an exchange of information and your job is to hear and understand Can you check the details of what's being said to you? Can you get some clarity over why is this an issue? What what is the actual problem here? Um, How can I improve that? Sometimes we receive feedback from people who are quite ambiguous or they just lump everything in together like in a big grey mess and, you know, give you really vague statements. People aren't happy with what you're doing. What people? What am I doing? What am I doing it? How am I doing it and why is it wrong? You know, like we need to get some clarity. Sometimes you need to ask for, you know, can you provide me with an example? That's a great observation you've made. I'd really love to get a bit of clarification about that. Can you provide me with an example of that? This is not necessarily the time to go into argument and rebuttal. Mm. We need to try and be open to hearing what's being said, but also starting to form our ideas about what is this feedback actually about? I really love that when you said like we need to consider it as an exchange of information, I love that because we can often take feedback and immediately personalise it. What does it say about me as a human being? But Mm. if we just see it as an exchange of information, then we can distance ourselves from it, become a bit more objective, and that can give us the time and space to actually be like, Okay, Um, let's gather more information to make it less ambiguous. So I would say for listeners, don't be afraid to say to your supervisor, like when you said X, did you mean Y? Can you give me an example? Those things that Betty just said. Don't be afraid to actually ask for clarity because you want to enhance your understanding so that this can be a learning opportunity for you. You know, I know your listener was talking about harsh feedback or unhelpful feedback. That is so hard to deal with. This is not the time to go toe-to-toe with your supervisor and call them out for being a meanie. You know, it's not going to end well for you and it's not going to end well for your supervisor. Nobody likes to be caught that way. Sometimes it's best to see if you can round it up. Look, thanks for the feedback. I have a really clear idea about what went wrong in that situation. Do you have any suggestions for how I could make some change? Or do you mind if I take a break and can I book a time to come back with you and follow this up with you? It's not about shutting the other person down, but sometimes if you can feel inside yourself that you can't cope anymore and it's just disintegrated into vague, ambiguous, you know, everything's a problem, you're not going to be able to fix that at all. So it's best to sort of like, thank you, thank you for your time. I've got a better idea of what's gone wrong. Can I come back? Can I make an appointment and come back and check with you in a week's time or so? And that's protecting ourselves as well. We're recognising I'm feeling very overwhelmed by this situation, so I'm just going to wrap it up pleasantly and then book another time when I feel I have better capacity to come back and unpack this. And in that moment, what are we talking about? We're talking about managing our emotional response. And that is never easy when we feel challenged. But when you recognize someone's just being mean, and we see it in the workplace, we are overworked, we are under-resourced, we work with people, None of we're not perfect, they're not perfect. But if we can take a break and come back, it's much better for us in the long run. It gives you space to go and find yourself a support person. Somebody might be quite um, challenging or unprofessional or just downright rude with you, when you're one-on-one, there's that power displacement. They're your supervisor and they've been around for 20 years and you're some fresh kid off the block, what do you know? You know, there's that power imbalance there. Find yourself a support person. Who is someone who can just be an emotional support for you? Who is someone who can hear what is being said? Because the minute there's a third party in the room or someone is taking notes or someone is hearing the way you're being spoken to, 
it tends to it tends to temper what is actually shared. Mm. And this is maybe a good point to point out that there is a difference between feedback and criticism and bullying, right, Betty? Definitely. Yeah. So sometimes folks are mean. Sometimes supervisors do bully people. Sometimes they do criticize and that is different to feedback. So we still need to follow the things that we were saying before for regulating your emotions. But my recommendation would be to get a reality check with somebody else because sometimes we can feel bad and then use emotional reasoning and then say that, okay, the supervisor must have said something bad because I feel bad. But that might not be the case, but it might also be the case. So it's good to get a reality check with a peer, another senior clinician, and just see whether you can understand and contextualize the feedback. Um, What would your recommendations be for, I guess, discerning the difference between feedback and criticism, Betty? Oh, Bron, I have to say I agree with you 100%. This person has a certain perspective of me and feels that I'm not fulfilling my role. Fair enough. Who else feels that way? Are there different points of view? Um, What else has influenced this here? Time to check that out. You know, your colleagues, if you work in a supportive place, your colleagues will tell you, you know, things that are good and things that are not so great about you. But sometimes you need a third party who can hear the story, take you through the elements of the story and be professional and give you some, some supportive feedback about what's going on. Your, um, Primary supervisor is a person that would you should you should go to. You can talk to them about these things. Do you have a mentor in the workplace? Do you have a safe space that you can go and talk to someone? Are some of these things that you do need to check in with HR? Like you said, Bron, there's a fine line between receiving criticism, feedback, or workplace bullying. If you feel that it's starting to move into that area of bullying, if you feel that it's starting to move into that area where it's personalized, you need to document this and you need to check it with someone. It does happen. It happens in our field. It happens in all fields. And it is one of the worst toxic traits of workplaces today. And, and no one should have to work under those situations. No, absolutely. But we do, need to, we do need to check what is the reality that's going on here and who are the people that can help me discern, is this criticism, is this feedback, or is this bullying? Mm, so ultimately, we're saying don't ignore your feelings as well. Like, don't be like, oh, this is fine. It's like, if guys, if you feel like that there is something not quite right here, do get a check with somebody else. Oh, definitely. But I think I think that's why it's really helpful to summarize that feedback. Yes. Let's get some details. Let's get some clarity. What is it you need me to improve? Okay. Now I need to check in with, is this an option for me? Is being compassionate to vulnerable people something that my workplace doesn't approve of? Is this something that I can change about myself? Who we are is so deeply interwoven. We really can't change that easily just to meet a workplace. So I need to look at, have my core values been challenged here or is it simply a skill I don't have and I can simply acquire it? Is it a policy I was unaware of? I can understand it. And I can work within that framework. But if I can't work within that framework, what does that mean? If I can, I'm going to have to swallow my pride. I'm going to have to acknowledge I don't know everything and I'm not perfect at everything. And I need to look at gaining some serious skills to complete my job. So who are the people that are going to help me there? Am I going to have a growth mindset around receiving feedback? and look at change and challenge, be uncomfortable in the short term, but no, this is where growth and change come from. Or am I going to have a fixed mindset and say, nope, they're wrong, I'm completely perfect, and now I'm going to job shop for the next 10 years and never develop some skills? This is radical acceptance, right? This has been like, this is the reality, what am I going to do? Rather than struggling against the reality. And the reality is that we're not going to be perfect. We're going to do some things well, some things not so well. And we're going to have to ask those challenging questions around what we're going to do next. And radical acceptance, remember, is about two completely different truths existing in the same space. Mm -hmm. I can acknowledge I'm new at this job, I'm vulnerable, I don't have everything, or I'm still learning. I've got some skills, but I'm not perfect. And the truth for my employer can also exist that, you know, I've got to do some more work. I've got to do some more training. I can think I'm doing a great job. And they can still see a deficit in my skill set. And those two things can exist in the same space. It's okay. 
Yeah, because going with a growth mindset, it's that we can learn. So rather than a fixed mindset that I can't learn, I can't grow. Psychologists love to learn. Usually we're all lifelong learners. And so we want to be able to grow and learn. And I feel like that lends itself really well to adopting that growth mindset with feedback. You know, the other thing that I think is really important at the end of a feedback session or when you're ready to when you're ready to check in again is to go and connect with your provider the feedback provider again later. You know, this is uncomfortable for you, but this is uncomfortable for them as well. Is this space for me to make an improvement? Is it is it time management? Is it the way I speak to people? Is it is it something is it a skill that I can gain or have I made an error? And if I've made an error, one of the best things is to just own it. You know, you own that error and people are more than happy to help you. It shows you've got humility, it shows you've got dignity. It shows that you're ready to learn. Who doesn't want someone like that on their team? And it creates better relationships. Like I'm just thinking of my own example. I usually give this example when I talk to, if I if I disclose with clients about mistakes that I've made in the past. But when early on in my uh, provisional career, I was working at a private hospital. There were many different programs. I was working on the seniors program. The seniors program, there was morning tea. And there were there was the eating disorder program, morning tea for the eating disorder program and the seniors program was in the same fridge. One day, the eating disorder program needs specific food. So they have specific food. One day, I accidentally took the morning tea for the eating disorder clients to the seniors room. Seniors had a ball eating that morning. They had really nice uh, specific food, but poor eating disorder clients did not have any food and they had to get food remade. And <laughs> and I was told very firmly that you have made a mistake, Brad, when you took the eating disorder patient's food. Oopsie. Roman, that's a great story. I think that's one of my favourite stuff stories. I it was love a great it. mistake. At the time, I was mortified and I was like, oh my gosh, I've deprived like people with anorexia of their food. <laughs> I'm a monster. Um, but like in the future, like I remember like subsequently, I would check with the cook who was standing by the fridges and I'd be like, seniors, not eating disorder. And they'd be like, seniors. And I'd be like, great. And we can have a little laugh about it afterwards. It wasn't too bad because the kitchen could come up with another plate for, so they did get their food but it was That's what's it was, important here <laughs> yeah I was mortified at the time but it actually did create better relationships in the future with the cook and the staff around me because I could actually acknowledge like yep I did an oopsie like I took the wrong food it was an honest mistake I wasn't being um, mean and spiteful, but it was a big oopsie and that's okay. I'm, I learned and I did not make the same mistake again. But doesn't that also take the sting out of the error? It does. You know, it becomes a funny story rather than a story of shame. Yeah. And, and people share it and people remember it and people acknowledge it. And, and it's just it's just a part of life and it takes that sting of shame out of it too. It really does because at the time I remember feeling quite quite upset with myself and the, the hospital, like I really respect the hospital and I want to do my best job and I did feel ashamed but talking about it with colleagues, airing it out, owning it, acknowledging I had made a mistake, like we're all humans, billions of people make mistakes every day. I'm a human, I make mistakes, that's okay. But, fix it, but fixing it and yeah. learning to not do it again. Yeah, fixing it, taking tangible steps, owning it, communicating more, making sure that I did not make the same mistake. So not all feedback is bad then? No, it's not, yeah. I mean, maybe this goes on to our ways of receiving good feedback. For me, like the key elements that made that a really great learning experience was there was a clear mistake. It was clear what I needed to do to repair the mistake. And mm -hmm. I had a clear set of actions. So that ambiguity was reduced. And it sounds like when we're talking about feedback, Betty, reducing that ambiguity by getting clarification from your supervisor seems to be really helpful. I think I received some feedback once. A very quick story. Yeah. Um, I received um, a, a prisoner I'd worked with had, had, left the, had left custody and he left a lovely little note to say, um, thanks for working with me. You know, I won't be back all the best. Um, the note was popped on my desk. Um, I didn't bring it into the office. So I didn't um, solicit the, the thank you note. Um, and when I saw it, I was like, oh, isn't that lovely? Acknowledged it and just popped it in the bin. You know, we do have to be mindful of keeping those boundaries with those relationships. Um, weeks and weeks and weeks later, I received feedback from the same supervisor that provided me the other feedback 
And there was a lot of, there was a big time delay in receiving that information. There was a lot of ambiguous statements about people are talking about you without clarifying statements of what they were actually saying. Um, it really created a lot of distrust for the workplace that I was in. Um, again, um, I felt it was really unclear. There was a lot of vagueness. So that's not productive in terms of owning the problem or changing the problem. Um, she was quite upset. So I found it really hard to receive the feedback because I was really fixated on her emotional response. And I was also thinking, oh, crikeys, have I done something else that she's not game to tell me? So she's using this as a stick to punish oh, me with. Oh, interesting. And she probably wasn't, but, but that's because how I it was felt. ambiguous, you didn't know. Yeah. And it was also, I felt it was really nitpicky. And I think, I think there's a difference between being specific in providing feedback and then just the other person being really unhelpful and, and, and wanting you to fit into their vision of the world as opposed to uh, allowing you to be yourself and bring your way of working. And, and there were other people that were at fault for breaching those boundaries and bringing that note in. But there was no information provided to me about follow-up from that. So I was getting a scolding from my mother is what it felt like. And yet there was a lack of transparency about who was involved, who had been talking about me as opposed to what had occurred, and um, there was a lack of transparency of what the follow-up would be. And I always think that that's the problem when people provide feedback is, okay, so if there's been if there's been a breach because there's an awareness of policy or whatever, how do we make sure that everybody else in the room is aware of that so that it doesn't occur again? Mm. I think a feed an email to the team saying, hey, guys, just to remind you, blah, 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 would have been helpful because then I would have felt perhaps not so identified as you've done a bad thing and people are talking about you and that's not helpful feedback. No, it's not. So it was the, she was having difficulty managing her own emotions. There was a lack of transparency. There was ambiguity. It also felt like nitpicking. So you didn't know why it was important, what she was communicating. And it also felt like you were being singled out. Is that right? Yeah, so I acknowledge a note was passed to me, um, to the company I work for, that was considered um, some confusion over roles and relationships and the the opportunity for me to take advantage of someone that I've worked with that's been in a vulnerable position. I acknowledge those things. But this is weeks and weeks and weeks after that incident. I was not responsible for getting the note, bringing the note, writing the note. I was transparent with, oh, isn't that sweet, and popped it in the bin. So it was kind of like, mm, this sounds like a storm in a teacup here. I'm not really sure what the message is that you're trying to give me, especially because you're having such a strong emotional response to something that's really weak old news. Uh, what I'm hearing is that it was something that was outside of your control. So it, yeah. to me, it's not good feedback because it's not something that you can change. You can't dictate that this prisoner and prisoners in the future aren't going to leave notes. I guess you can only do remind the prisoners that these notes are not appropriate, it's not appropriate to do that, but it's not something that you can control. I didn't seek it. Yeah. I didn't I didn't brag about it. I didn't hide it. You know, there was no subterfuge that went on. And I I found this was perhaps one of the most difficult um, feedbacks to receive because I really think it did go against who I was. I did try and be heard about, well, okay, I can hear, this is what you're saying. Let me summarize the feedback you're giving me. This is my response to what you're saying. But um, the supervisor who was providing it just couldn't shift from her emotional response and even acknowledge what I was saying. So not feeling heard, the two of us didn't find that um, very satisfying at all. So how do we cope with that? Like, how did you cope? Your needs weren't met in that moment or afterwards. You didn't feel heard. It really went against your self-image. How do you cope with that? Do you sit with that yourself or do you debrief with other people or do you do something else? Well, luckily for me, this was the second time I'd received feedback. So I knew not to take um, an emotional dump on my colleagues because it doesn't also sit with them either. I, I, I just found it really disconcerting 
but I suppose I could recognize it for what it was, that it was not about me. It was something that was out of my control. It wasn't a skill failure on my behalf. I didn't recognize what was going on in the room. And so I just sat with it for a while and just let it go. There's nothing I can do to shift that person. Once people are are um, firmly in that position, I can apologize for the things that I'm responsible for, but I can't take responsibility for things that I'm not. This might point to something that early career psychs might be prone to do. We assume because we're in that supervisory relationship that the supervisor is always going to be right and we are always going to be wrong. But sometimes we need to remember that supervisors are human too and they have their own stuff. And this might be a them thing that we are not responsible for. No, and I think um, what happened after that was I did go and check with her a while later and um, I did provide some feedback. Well done. It was a bit challenging. It doesn't always go over really well, but again, what can you do? You're not responsible for everything. And I did just say, you know, I felt that there was some miscommunication on the day that I was not um, intending to act outside of procedures designed to keep both myself and the vulnerable clients safe. But um, I, f- I found that the information she provided was clouded by that ambiguity and, and the lack of transparency. Um, she didn't receive it um, fabulously, but she appreciated my time and, and we left it there. Like we're not always going to get resolution with feedback. I think that's something we, that's part of being a grown up. Mm. We, we're not always going to get that resolution. We're not always going to be heard. People aren't always going to change their mind. Sometimes people are going through their own, um, stuff and sometimes they bring it to work because they're human just like we are. But it sounds like that was part of your integrity to want to go back and, Um, give her the feedback. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've had other times when um, I've, um, I don't want to use the word challenge, but where I've questioned information that's been provided to me. You know, I acknowledge I'm 53. I'm probably a lot older than some of your listeners. So I acknowledge I've got years of experience. This is not something that's easy. But the the stronger your identity is, the more you know who you are, the more able you are to go and engage in these things respectfully. And um, I've spoken to a supervisor when I've asked questions about information provided and she actually spoke to my supervisor and said that um, that I was a bit aggressive. So I went and spoke to her and said to her, I think robust conversation is important in workplaces. I didn't intend to upset you, but I will always be assertive about things that I feel passionate about. You know, if I've hurt your feelings or if I've come across the wrong way, I'm happy to receive feedback on that. But, um, you know, it wasn't my intention to upset you. But miscommunication adds, adds to the problem of understanding what this feedback is actually about. Yeah. I feel like what you just said is like an advanced skill. Like when I hear you say that, that you actually said like, I'm sorry, I didn't intend to hurt your feelings. I'm like, oh, this is, this is big girl conversations. Like, <laughs> Hey, you got to You got to name it to tame it. You do. I, uh, you know me, Bron, I don't, sh- I don't shy away from those emotions. I mean, it's amazing. I'm in awe of you. I think it's fantastic. I guess like something that I'm that we keep on returning to is that it's really unhelpful with feedback when it's not clear. So a basic like level one thing that listeners can do is really ask their supervisors for that clarification around the feedback. And a way that you can do that is by saying, so I've heard you say this, this, and this, I'm going to work on that. Um, Does that sound, is that what you were saying? Does that sound good? So really just summarize, is that what you would recommend as well, Betty? Definitely. That's that whole is this a personality issue? Is, it, is, is there a problem with me? Yeah. Am I just, you know, is this a skill set issue? Is it something that I need to develop? And if so, that's great. Mm. Where is that support going to be? Is that a course I need to do? Is that some PD I need to do? Do I need a mentor? Like, how am I going to develop that skill? How am I going to develop that muscle? Or is it a policy and procedure thing? You cannot expect to know the workplace culture until you've lived in it for some time. So be kind to yourself and give yourself some space. But it is about identifying, okay, this feedback, what is it about? What is helpful? What can I do about it? And what am I accountable for here? So we could even ask supervisors some of those questions. So we could be like, what do you think would help me improve in the future with this? And it might be like, 
I recommend you get some personal therapy about this. It's not meant to be as a criticism from the supervisor. It's meant that I think you could be helped further with working on this like personal aspect. Or it could be, okay, I think we need to do some mentorship around this and supervision. But yeah, I would say to listeners, don't be afraid of asking for specifics. It will really help reduce the rumination later. Definitely. Take that break. Settle your emotions. Yeah. Hear what's being said. Clarify what's going on. And then ask, what can I do from here? Yeah. You know, whenever in our own personal relationships, when we've upset somebody, someone we, we love and we want to keep uh, in relationship with, we say, how can I fix this? Doesn't that take the energy out of the room straight away? Mm, it does. We're on the same page. We're headed the same direction. We want to work towards yeah. something together and it's the same in the workplace. I agree. What can I do to fix this? What would you suggest? Let me acknowledge that, you know, you've been in this role for many years. You've probably seen this before. What would you suggest? It puts you on the same team. And that feedback is constructive as opposed to being on oppositional teams and you're not hearing what the other person is saying. Yeah, absolutely. I I really love what you said before as well, just picking up on the be kind to yourself because I'm just thinking with re- receiving feedback, I would say it's a skill as well. Like I used to be, I think, poorer at receiving feedback than I am now. And it's been a learning process. I remember early on in my provisional, I made another mistake. I uh, uh, Patients were talking about their dog dying. And then I had recently had a dog pass away. And so I mentioned that my dog had died. And then my supervisor said to me, why did you share that your dog had died? And from my perspective, I was trying to connect with them, but I can see in hindsight that it wasn't appropriate for me to counter their dog dying with my dog dying. Um, But after she gave me that feedback at the end of that day, I burst out into tears and I was so upset and I just couldn't, I was beating myself up so harshly. I was like, what an idiot, I can't believe you did that. Um, But now I'm much kinder to myself. I handle feedback much better, but that's taken a few years. Oh, look, even today I was talking to someone. I was impatient because I was time poor. And I put my foot in my mouth and all afternoon I was thinking, I can't believe you said that. You're so stupid. What were you thinking? Why can't you just shut up? Oh, no. You know, everybody does it. Yes. But I came home. I told my daughter. She said to me, oh, mum, you're too hard on yourself. Yeah. And laughed. And um, like that, it's evaporated. It's fine, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, honestly, guys, like, no biggie. Like, you're all right. You're a good person. You're trying your best. You're doing a good That's job. Right. And we all put our foot in, foots in our mouths and we all make mistakes and we all look back on it and be like, that was fun. It's just a learning experience. That's right. But I, I look, you know, I always think the best thing for um, provisional psychs to do, for all psychs to do, is to know who you are. Yes. Know what you're about. Know what your boundaries are. That is the stuff that makes it much easier for you to go and have these challenging conversations with your supervisor because you know who you are. You know what you're about. I know, I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea and I'm okay with that, but I'm going to always try and be respectful and kind, but I'm also not going to be walked over. Like I know those boundaries for myself and they're hard won boundaries. So you've got to kind of do that work yourself. What will you put up with? What won't you put up with? You know, can you work within this framework? You know, is this issue challenging your core values or is it something that you can learn and adapt and change with? You know, Betty, I didn't realize when we first started this episode that receiving feedback touches on so much stuff. I didn't think this was going to be such a rich topic, but it's like we've gone we've gone everywhere. I feel like we've gone to the core of being a psychologist and like who we are and our identities. It's amazing. It, well, but that's the thing, isn't it? We, we know in our heads we're not perfect. Yeah. Last time I spoke to you, I said, why would I want to be perfect? It's the most boring thing to be. <laughs> so true. But I don't want anyone to tell me I'm not perfect. <laughs> oh my God, I'm sure so I don't want you to tell me that to my face. <laughs> so that's that inconsistency with the human spirit, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Oh my gosh, that's so true. It's like, I know I'm not perfect, but, but please don't tell me that I'm not. That's right. <laughs> and, and so sometimes hearing that feedback really triggers that, doesn't it? It does, absolutely. It, it can really hurt. So, I mean, from my perspective, here's what I want to summarize, but actually I'll ask you first, Betty. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you just want to give a voice to? No, I think I think we've done a great job on covering all of the aspects of feedback. But I suppose I would just say to people, if it hurts, take a moment, 
hear it, hang on to it and review it later. Yes, I I agree with that. And I think my takeaway is I really love what Betty said. I'm going to steal Betty's takeaway, which is be kind to yourself. <laughs> Sorry, Betty, you stole, stole, your, stole your flame there. Oh, look, I, oh, I say to people all the time, when the plane is going down, what does the pilot say? He says, put your own oxygen mask on so that you can help others. So always, always, always take care of yourself. You cannot help others if you're not taking care of yourself. Yeah, no, 100%. And I mean, just adding to that, it's my takeaway is as well, it's like, guys, be kind to yourself. Ask your supervisor for clarification around things. Make it less ambiguous. If it feels ambiguous, make it less ambiguous if Definitely. you can. And always get specific, tangible things that you can do differently as well. Debrief with somebody else because you might feel like they are criticizing you. They might not or they could be. So get a reality check. Don't ignore your feelings. Acknowledge them. Make sure you take them to somebody else and take it as a learning opportunity, as Betty said. If you're going to receive, if you're going to receive feedback, what's the action plan that comes from it? Are you, are you being checked and challenged for who you are? Or have you done something that's that doesn't fit within the company process? And that's okay. Yes. But what does that action plan look like? And if you've gotten this far without the support, how can you go any further if there is no support? Where is that support coming from? Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming back, friend of the podcast, Betty. And I'm so grateful that we could unpack this really important topic. And to the listener who requested it, thank you so much. I really hope we have touched on those things that you sent in the email. And I hope that this was helpful for other listeners. Listeners, if you do want to get in touch and suggest an episode, feel free to send me an email. I'm Bron. Send me an email at mentalworkpodcast at gmail.com. In the meantime, take care, guys, and catch you later. Bye. Bye.